1 Samuel 22, verse number 1. And the word declares, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. When his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him, and every one that was in distress, and every one that was in debt, and every one that was discontented, gathered themselves unto him, and he became captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Turn over to chapter number 30. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. Chapter 30, verses 1 through 6. And the word declares, And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziglag, on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south, and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. And so David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his son and for his daughter. But David encouraged himself. In the Lord his God. You may be seated in the presence of our life changing King. You know, King David, whom we know now as such, gives us lessons and examples on how to live a life of service. Now, there are four main aspects of his life. We have David as a son, as Jesse's son. We have David as a servant of Saul. David as a soldier of the Lord on the run. And then we have David as a sovereign, a supreme ruler, monarch, or king of Israel. Israel. And so we've been sharing over the last couple of services on the first two aspects and I hope to get to the third, or I will get to the third aspect on today. And we'll see what the Lord says for the fourth aspect as we go along in the upcoming weeks. But we talked about David, his role as a son. He lived a life of service even as a son. We found that in 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, that the Lord gave Samuel the assignment to go to Jesse to anoint one of his sons. The story is that Jesse paraded seven sons before Samuel. And then Samuel said, the Lord haven't chosen any of these. And Samuel asked, is there another? And he said, yes, for he keepeth the sheep. This was that 15 year old boy, David. So David was just relegated to this role of keeping sheep. But God told Samuel, before it was all done that don't look on their outward appearance for I don't look on the outward appearance God says I look on the heart so don't choose him by how he looks because I have one and he may not look the way you think he should look but I've chosen him and so Samuel anoints him as the next king of Israel and God didn't waste his time by choosing David David was committed to a life of service. As a son, as a boy, he was responsible. David was responsible to take care of his father's sheep. He embraced that role. He protected his sheep from sh his sheep, his father's sheep from bears and from lions. And David was very proud of keeping sheep. As, as a son, David, he was reliable. 
The Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, verse number 17, and you can turn there, it shows how that Jesse said unto David, his son, Take now thy brethren an ephah of this parched coin and ten loaves, and run to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses, or cuts of cheese, unto the captains of their thousand, and look how their brethren fare, and take their pledge, or take their report. And now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the keeper or the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And so Jesse asked his young son David to check on his brothers to take them some food, some supplies and get a report in verse number 20. David, we find that he didn't allow those sheep that he was responsible for to just be placed anywhere, but he puts them with a keeper of the sheep, shows that he's both responsible and he's reliable. His father could rely on him to take the stuff down to his brother, and David was able to fulfill the task. The Bible says that he did just as Jesse commanded him to do. So he was responsible, he was reliable. David, as a son, he was also righteous. Somebody say righteous. You know, when Goliath came out to fight the children of Israel, he taunted them. And David, after he finished what his father told him to do, he was interested in the fight. He saw Goliath coming out and taunting the children of Israel. And he said to them, he said, what is it that you will give the person that takes this joker down. And he looks at Goliath, David is a young boy, and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that thinks that he can defy the armies of the Lord? David has righteous indignation. So the third thing we see with David, he was righteous. He says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And the cause was to take the reproach off of Israel's name. That God, he was known as a God of war. God had spared the children of Israel on so many occasions. God had worked miracles. And they had heard of all of the miracles that God had worked. And now they were embarrassed because they had this Goliath coming out every day, taunting the children of Israel. And you know, David, he had been on the backside of the desert keeping those sheep in the Bible saying, that one time a lion came and one time a bear came and David slew the lion and the bear with his bare hands. So David knew that God was a giant slayer. And so we know the story how that David, he took five smooth stones and a slingshot and he killed them with the first one. Can the church say amen? Amen. David was a righteous man. After David kills Goliath, Saul asked, whose son is this youth? In verse number 55. He said, whose son? And Abner said, as thy soul liveth, I have no idea. But in verse 58, Saul said to David, who art you? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, David, Jesse. Yep, Jesse. Well, I'm getting all these names here. Let me get them right. He said, I am the son of thy servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And so David was committed to living life as a servant, as a son of Jesse. The second one is that he was committed to living life as a servant of Saul. So as a son of Jesse, he was committed to living a life of service as a servant to Saul. Now y'all gotta forgive me while I'm reviewing a little bit because I'm ready to get to this really that I came to share with you on today. Can y'all forbear me just for a few more minutes for those that may need to be caught up and so you know sometimes I'm ready to go to this end part and I'm coming through this part and I'm trying to make sure that I, I, I make it succinct and that you understand because I'm ready to get to that last part and it's like a train on the track. So. So somebody say, slow down, pastor. Don't tell me that. Somebody say, preach, preacher. 
as a servant, David served as Saul's minister or his armor bearer. In 1 Samuel 16, verse number 21, in the NIV, it says, David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. That's like a personal assistant, somebody that carried the armor, somebody that stood by the king in times of trouble, somebody that was willing to stand in front and even catch a bullet if they needed to for the king. So he was there. The Bible says in verse number 22 in the NIV, then Saul sent word to Jesse saying, allow David to remain in my service for I am pleased with him. And so we see God didn't waste his time with David. David was, he was, he was responsible. He was reliable. He was a righteous man, but he also was willing to serve as Saul's minister. And the Bible says that he pleased Saul in his service. Can the church say amen? amen. Verse number 23, it says, And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hands. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed. So David also was a minstrel. An evil spirit would come upon Saul. You know, when God anointed David through Samuel, the Bible said that the spirit of the Lord lifted up off of Saul and an evil spirit came upon him. And so David is providentially gifted to play a harp. And so David is able to go in and play and deal with this evil spirit. And when he would play, this spirit would lift up off of Saul. He was Saul's minstrel. Somebody say minstrel. When you read on down further in the uh, chapters, it goes to chapter number 18 because what happened, and I'll just brief it up for you, what happened, um, we find that, that, that David went out to battle and the Bible says that David um, had gone out and killed several, his people killed several, Saul gone out, his people killed several, and the women were dancing and singing, saying that David killed his 10,000, Saul killed his thousand, and the Bible said it grieved Saul to no end, and from that point he was determined to kill him. So he had this evil spirit that would come upon him from time to time. David is playing as a minstrel to get this thing up off of him. And the whole time Saul is looking at him, the Bible says Saul eyed him from that day forward. When the ladies were singing, Saul was so jealous of David at this point. And so it said that one day that David was in there playing his harp, and Saul took his javelin and tried to pin him to the wall with it. Now, if I get a name wrong, y'all know I got a lot of names up here, so y'all know what I'm saying. So David almost got pinned to the wall by Saul. David said, I got to get out of here. But Saul says, I'm going to give you a thousand soldiers. And David went on and everything he did, he just, he just was successful because God was with him. Saul tells him, he says, listen, I'm going to give you my daughter, Michal, or Michael, to you, and this is what I want you to do to pay me for my kindness. David says, I'm a poor man. How can I pay you? He says, I want a thousand or a hundred foreskins from the Philistines. So David, you know, David goes in with his men, and he kills 200 Philistines and brings 200 foreskins back. And the Bible said that Saul said he was more determined than ever to kill David. David said, I really got to get out of here now. So David flees to this cave called Medullam. He's no longer a military officer under Saul. Now he's a soldier of the Lord on the run. He's no longer a military officer because he can't sit at a table. If he sit at a table, well, he's going to throw his javelin at him or he's going to get somebody to come up behind him and take him out. So David, he goes to a cave called Adullam. 
And in Adullam is what we read earlier. We want to look at David as a soldier of the Lord. He's kind of like a renegade soldier because he's really running for his life. He's hiding. But in the midst of that, he's going on little escapades, making sure that his soldiers keep their warfare sharp making sure that their needs are met. David is going in, and because the Lord is with him, even as a renegade soldier on the run, on the run with a few men, he's still able to do whatever he wants to do and needs to do to survive because the Lord was with him. Can the church say amen? And so we find that David, in 1 Samuel 22, verse number 1, it says, and therefore David departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Listen, and everyone that was in distress, listen, everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him and he became captain over them. Saul had given him a thousand, but he was no longer a military officer in Saul's army, Israel's army. So now he's on his own, and now you got people that are going to follow him, and the people that's following him are not quite military officers. They're not quite soldiers at all. But the Bible says that the folks that were depressed, in distress, in debt, discontented, everybody that had a problem went and joined themselves to David. If you got a problem, go see David. You don't want to do it no more, go join David. You in too much debt, forget the debtors or the people that you owe and go be with David. David had everybody who was in trouble with him. It said, didn't it say everyone that was in distress? You know, that's like Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take this yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, come unto me. That's what David was a type of Christ. We know that Christ was the seed of David. So some of the things that you see in the Old Testament really foreshadows what Christ would come to do. Christ said, I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. Christ is the body of it. Those things were shadows. So David is operating as a type of Christ. The Bible says David became captain over these folks. You know, you should be able to come to the house of God you know the house of God should be a type of cave of a doulum to where you can come in and if you're in distress if you are in debt if you are discontented if you are depressed and I know I'm talking to some soldiers and former soldiers we know what it means and what it feels like to be in distress we know what it's like to be discontented. Even some of us, when we were private, sure know how to be in debt. I tell you what, when, 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 when the Gulf War kicked off, everybody was in church. We're coming to the house of the Lord, right? When we're in trouble, we're going to call on the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Didn't the churches fill up? They fill up because, you know, atheists, they call on the name of the Lord. Let them rounds start flying. They are like, Jesus, help me. Can the church say amen to that? So David goes from place to place on the run from Saul. And David had an opportunity to kill Saul, you know. David had an opportunity. See, he would have the jump on Saul even though Saul was after him David actually knew where Saul was and could watch Saul trying to find him David was ambushing the ambush 
One, one opportunity, you know, because, you know, David, he, he was the epitome of, uh, uh, you know, of a soldier. I call him a soldier. You know, y'all might want to call him a sailor, but there was no water. He, he might have been a Marine. He might have been a Marine. He might have been a Marine. But David knew leadership. He knew loyalty. He knew duty. He knew respect. He knew selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. You know, this is a former NCO, you know. I knew I knew a few things. So David, he epitomized the core values of God. Really, these are core values. For God, of God, some of his core values, some I say some of them, some of them. So he had a jump because God was with him and he was a man that understood some values. The first opportunity he gets in 1 Samuel, the 24th chapter, verse number three. Let's go there. I want to read it in the New Living's translation. Because we see that David, he was a wise man. He didn't do everything right, but he was a wise man. At least he listened to God. Yes. Y'all there? And so at that place where the road passes some sheepfold, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Verse number four, now your opportunity. Y'all see it? Now's your opportunity. David's men whispered to him, today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. I believe the New Living's translation says it this way, but King James said the spirit of the Lord smote him. Put verse number five up. Put verse number five. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart, not the spirit of the Lord, his heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. So that was the first opportunity. He was just toying with him because he knew that he was not supposed to touch the Lord's anointing. How many know you're not supposed to touch the Lord's anointing? It's important that you keep your mouth off of who God has blessed. Even though David, even though David had been anointed king, he knew that he was the next one. He knew that the Lord had at one time anointed Saul. And he was not supposed to put his mouth, his hand, not even clip a hem of his skirt, of his garment. David wasn't supposed to touch him at all. He was careful about protocol. He was careful about holy things and holy people. Can the church say amen? There's a message in that. The second opportunity is in 1 Samuel, the 26th chapter, verse 7. This is the second opportunity. David gets a jump on Saul. And so David and Abishai went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep and with his spear stuck in the ground beside his head. And Abner and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. God has surely handed your enemy over to you this time. Abishai whispered to David, let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't need a second time. Well, that's pretty ruthless, ain't it? All I need is one strike. I I'm sure. Verse 9, no, David said, don't kill him. For who can remain innocent 
after attacking the Lord's anointed one. So, you know, he epitomized these values of honor and integrity. David was careful to follow protocol. He understood that he was not to dishonor. He was not to dishonor or put his hands on the anointed of the Lord, even though God's spirit had already lifted off of him. David decides to take refuge in the land of the Philistines. Are y'all still with me? And in the land of the Philistines, they are enemies of Israel. So David is able to stay with his enemies for long periods of time. And the Bible says that when a man's ways please God, he'll make even his enemies to be at peace with him. So the Philistines, they go to fight Israel. And David, being with the Philistine, Israelite, Hebrew, with the Philistine, decides, I'm going to fight Israel with you. So the, the, the king is saying, yeah, we want David with us because if David is with us, yes, he's the one, he's the one that they sang 10,000 about. Y'all know that song? It says it in the text. He's the one that they sang, David killed his 10,000, Saul killed his thousand. David, yes, come with us. Fight with us. But then the captains of the Philistine army, they said, no, David might look at this as an opportunity to get back in good with his people. So no, he might get in the middle of the battle and turn on us. So they said, no, David, you can't go with us. So David and his men, they go back to their camp. Now, they've been gone three days. And when they get back to their camp, they find that their camp has been raided by the Amalekites, another one of those ites. And so that's the text that we read earlier. Let's read it again. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag and smitten Ziglag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captive that were therein, and they slew not any, great or small. Somebody say, the enemy may come up against you, but he won't prosper. It appears that he has prospered on David because he carried them away, and they went on their way. So David and his men came to the city. Behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken, and David and the people were lifted up their voice and wept. And wouldn't you lift up your voice and wept when you came back to your camp and your children and your wives were gone and everything that you had built up was burned down? The Bible said that they had no more power to weep. That means that you cried and you cried and you cried some more and you couldn't even muster any more tears. You was just dry crying. You were crying to where you couldn't even cry no more. They were that sad. They were that sad. And the Bible says that David, in the midst of his men wanting to stone him, the Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. This is a dire situation. So we find that David, number one, he encouraged himself in the Lord. As a servant of the Lord, as a soldier in the army of the Lord, David learned to encourage himself in the Lord. It's one thing to be encouraged by somebody else. And surely we need to be encouraged by others. But there comes a time in your life where you have to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. And this is an emergency situation. This is a situation that the circumstances are severe. And David, in the middle of this predicament, in the middle of this conundrum, David encourages him himself in the Lord. You know, we can imagine what David might have said because we have a whole book of Psalms on David encouraging himself. 
David sang songs unto the Lord. It, it might have been Psalms 34. Just put up Psalms 34. He might have said this because this is in his vernacular. This is his mode of thinking. David is now sharing the psalm. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast of the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Well, y'all say that might have been a corporate one. He says, I sought the Lord, verse 4, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I'm not afraid right now because I sought the Lord. Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. Maybe he said what they say over in Psalms 27. Turn to Psalms 27. Psalms 27. Maybe he said this in verse number one. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Listen, when the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though and host encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war shall rise against me, and this will I be confident. What did he say? Verse number four, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the the days of my life or well, maybe he went over to Psalms 3 maybe it was Psalms 3 that David began to recite out of his heart because you know he was the writer he was the composer Psalms 3 verse number 1 it says this Psalms 3 Lord how are they that increase that trouble me many are they that rise up against me Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Verse 3, but he says, but thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. For thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. He encouraged himself in the Lord. So he pulled himself together, encouraged himself. Then he goes to the priest and he says, bring me the ephod. Bring me the ephod. Now the ephod was the names of the children of Israel across the shoulders of the priest. He would put it on and then they would make petitions before God and God would see the names of the children of Israel and remember his promise that he made to him and so David put God in remembrance of his word by bringing the ephod God you said that you would bless us God you said that you would protect us God you said that you would keep our enemies away but our enemies have come the Bible says that David inquired of the Lord E N Q U the first thing is that he what he do first no the first thing I just told you he encouraged himself not only did he encourage himself but he inquired of the Lord he says Lord Shall I pursue? Shall I go after this troop? Now, this is an obvious thing to me. I'm thinking if they've taken all my stuff, they've taken my wife, they've taken our son and daughter, come on, let's go. David inquires of the Lord. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, God answered, and God said, pursue 
Now David knew this is what he wanted to do, but he wanted to get permission from God because if he got permission from God, he knew that he was assured the victory. Sometimes we may know what to do, but we want to get reassurance from God. God, if you say it, I know that I'm going to have the victory and I'm going to go in and recover everything. Somebody say everything. So the Bible says, pursue, thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. You know, I believe that there are some folks in here that you have inquired of the Lord already about some things, and you've been waiting anticipating the response and maybe you have heard the response but I'm coming to tell you this day that there are some things that the enemy has stolen from you yes yes it may have been over the course of your military career in a particular fight that you were in a particular time in your life maybe during that time you lost some relationship maybe during that time maybe you lost some of your sanity Maybe you have been challenged with mental health. Maybe you have some PTSD from the things that you experience. And maybe it was the enemy's plot and his ploy to destroy you with what you have been through. But I've come to let you know that it's time to take up a tug of war stand. Some of us, we just need a tug of war stand. Because you know, in the game of tug of war, you have opposition on one end. And they begin to pull you. But what we need to understand that greater is he. That's on the inside of us than every antagonistic operative that's on the other side. And there's times that we need to go on the offensive. So maybe you have been kicked by the enemy. Maybe you have been pushed by the enemy. Maybe you have been punched by the enemy. But it's time to go in the enemy's camp and take back what he has stolen from you. Everything that he has come against you, you got to go back and get your stuff. Tell your neighbor, you got to go back and get your stuff. Where's your peace? Your peace might be over in the enemy's camp. Your joy might be over in the enemy's camp. Maybe your money is over in the enemy's camp. Maybe you lost somebody and they're in the enemy's camp. You just need to take on your posture. I'm taking back my joy. I'm taking back my peace. I'm taking back my mind. I'm taking back my emotions. I'm taking back my authority. I'm taking back every single thing that you stolen from me. Every single thing that you stolen from my family. Every single thing that you stolen over my military care, I'm taking back what you stolen from me. How many lost some things? How many lost some things? How many lost some things over the years? How many lost some things even during your time in the military? It's your season. It's your time to take authority over what has been having authority over you. It's time to... It's time to 
What? Just go ahead and name that thing. What's that thing? What's that thing? For the next 20 seconds, I want you to just name every single thing that you need to. Every single thing that you need to take back. Somebody say you need to take it back. What's that thing? What's that thing? Some of us, we just need to get our minds together. We need to take back our minds. Devil, you can't have no place in my mind. I take authority over my mind. The thoughts that I have that are wayward, the thoughts that I have that are sinful, the thoughts that I have that pulls me out of the will of God, I take back my mind. I bring every thought into subjection, into the captivity of Christ. I stand on the promises of God, for the promises of God are yea, yea, and amen. I believe that I'm a blood bought believer created in the image of God I possess the ability to reign and rule in this life I possess the ability to win sometimes you got to talk to yourself somebody say I'm taking it back I'm going into the enemy's camp and I'm taking it back give me my joy back give me my peace back Give me my children back. They've been out here too long. Give me what's mine. I want what's coming to me. Give me what's mine. Somebody say, yeah, I know that's right. Look at what the scripture says. Look at what the scripture says. You know, you know, he encouraged himself in the Lord he inquired of the Lord the Lord tells him to go and pursue and recover all and then we find that in the scripture it says this in 1 Samuel 30 verse 16 in the New Living's translation in the New Living's translation put it up in the New Living's and it came to pass verse 16 and so when he led David to them is that right? And they found the Amalekites spread across the fields, eating and drinking and dancing with joy because of the vast amount of plunder that had taken from the Philistines and the land of Judah. Verse 17, and David and his men rushed in among them and slaughtered them throughout that night and the entire next day until the evening until the break of dawn to the early none of the Amalekites escaped except 400 young men who fled on camels verse 18 David got back number three everything He encouraged himself in the Lord. He inquired of the Lord. God tells him to pursue. David pursues. He goes and David got back everything. Somebody say everything. See, you got to be serious about this thing. See, some of you are still afraid of the enemy. That some of you are still begging the enemy, come on, give me my stuff back. Oh, devil, leave me alone. Devil, stop bothering me. Oh, devil, stop bothering my children. But the Bible says the kingdom suffers by. Yes, and the violent, the kingdom suffers violent. And the violent take it. The violent take it the violent take it by force the violent take it by force and so we can't be shy or timid or afraid we got to encourage ourselves in the Lord just like David 
Where did David get his strength? From the Lord. Who did David talk to about the situation? The Lord. Who gave David the victory? The Lord. If you're going to take it back, I ain't just talking about you big and bad. I'm talking about the one that's on the inside of you. The one who gives you the victory. Thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory through our Lord. Jesus Christ, our victory is in him. Let's give him praise. Let's give him glory in the house. Somebody say, I'm taking it back. I'm taking back. Somebody say, everything. Everything, 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 everything. It's going to get better from here. Because when I get my stuff back, when I get my mind back, when I get my joy back, when I get my peace back, when I get my money back, when I get my children back, somebody say, I want it all back. Everything, everything, everything that he's stolen from me because it don't belong to him. Somebody say, it's mine. Somebody say, it's mine. I don't want yours. I just want what's, I just want what's mine. God says that he come to give us a good life. He come to bless us with an abundant life. And we ain't asking for nothing that don't belong to us. We just want the abundant life that Jesus promised to give to us. And so if the devil has it and he's a defeated foe, I'm not letting a defeated foe hang on to my stuff. Why would I let a defeated foe hang on to my stuff? Somebody say, I claim it because it's mine. I receive it because he's given it to me. I have it because it's my possession. I believe I'm a child of God. I believe I'm a son of God. I believe I'm a servant of the Lord. I believe I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. A one songwriter said, he says, I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Come here, Brother Joel. I'm a soldier in the army. I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier. Got my war clothes on. 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 I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier.